Hi everyone, I'm Federico. I'm the founder and CEO of Evmos. Um, so at Evmos, we're building EVM for Web3 businesses, allowing them to customize uh, their instances and more specifically, be able to define forward compatible uh, research and define their own. Yes, better. Let's go ahead. Yes. Um, Better. So basically allowing enterprises with three businesses in general to create their own blockchain for their business cases, which is what really matters behind this. And so today I'm going to be talking about this and how specifically the topic about access control for, for Web3 businesses and also relating it to my own experience as a student working with industry partners. Um, so a little bit about me, I've been in blockchain since 20, 2017. I was one of the first employees at Cosmos, which is this in ecosystem of interoperable blockchains where I was part of the team that shaped the inter-blockchain communication protocol, which is one of the major interoperability protocols in the entire crypto ecosystem. Uh, I've been working also on EVM research, EVM frameworks since 2020 and yeah, in 2022, we created Evmos, which is this EVM compatible network with full interoperability. So I wanted to relate it, this story where we're, where we're gonna be talking today with my experience as a student at uh, Blockchain at Berkeley, which is also a student-led organization that focuses on education, research, and also consulting. So by the way, you guys were asking how do you get in involved into the industry. Blockchain Berkeley has extremely great resources for blockchain fundamentals and blockchain for developers. Uh, it's all available on EDX. And the syllabus is also available online. So I definitely recommend you to look into the resources from Blockchain Berkeley. That's me in 2017 with the cohort from, from that semester. And so I had the opportunity to work with an industry partner on, on on consulting. And uh, this partner was uh, Qualcomm. So we were given this research, uh, this task particularly, how do we work with an industry partner that has this budget for the research and development in this new um, technology in 2017? Crypto wasn't very popular other than the ICO boom. And so we were the experts there. We had to develop a full solution for them to create a cons uh, consortium blockchain that would allow them to sell licenses for networking online. Okay, that what does Qualcomm do? We started to, to ask ourselves. And so one of the main th things that we realized, okay, Qualcomm is one of the main competitors uh, of Intel when it comes to smart on, uh, smartphone chips. So these chips are actually used in most of the Android devices for uh, 5G uh, and wireless communication. And they also use this technology for smart, car smart cars, electric vehicles. So all the, new the newer generations of electric vehicles are using this technology. They also, do other pro they also launch other products like antennas and other network communications more broadly. So we were in this scenario, we are the experts, we're just a bunch of students, how do we work with this industry and develop them a full-fledged solution? So these were their requirements from them. Um, particularly speaking, uh, they wanted a EVM network because the, in 2015 the, the ERC-20 token um, standard was created, so there was already a standard for tokens that they needed to use. Um, they also wanted it to be fully permissioned in a consortium environment, so a an, uh, few companies working together and selling these licenses on smart contracts, um, not on the public Ethereum blockchain, but in their own dedicated environment. Instant finality, which is extremely important for businesses. So you don't want, when you're dealing with businesses, you don't want to actually be able to roll back transactions because that messes entire accounting. Um, and so this instant finality also enables you to, to execute transaction, uh, immediately settles, settles the transaction on the blockchain, and you get the transaction confirmation. And the last requirement was that it had to be energy efficient. So energy efficient in the sense of not proof of work. Uh, proof of stake wasn't a thing, except from a few um, 
PBFT blockchains that enable fast finality. So um, Cosmos was one of them. And so this is the design that we came up with, and I'm going to be relating a little bit, like t talking about the different components of the different nodes. So every company had a specific node, so company A, uh, company B, company C, and there was a centralized onboarding node. Um, and a controller that was basically an account that would connect to the internal database, internal APIs, and that would also connect to the ledger to sell the licenses after someone wants to buy a networking license, etc. Please note that this uh, architecture does absolutely not make sense today. Uh, there are way easier ways to do this. Um, but the important thing is like, okay, how do, we, how do we create this environment, especially in a consortium chain with an EVM that has to be modified for the specific needs of this enterprise? And we ran into a lot of challenges, as you can imagine. First of all, there was no thing, such thing as BFT, uh, sorry, as um, uh, governance. Uh, so this limits as well, like the onboarding, you had to have this onboarding node, centralized onboarding node, um, instead of relying on the entire network's governance. So there's no proof of authority, um, no integrated access control, so you could not define which are the um, companies, or in this case, the accounts that are the ones allowed to deploy smart contracts. Um, there was also no stablecoin ecosystem, so how do you settle transactions for the licenses? So like back in 2017, there was only this uh, stablecoin that used um, Seniorag shares, so algorithm stablecoin that was called Basecoin that then uh, went out of market. And most importantly, there was no interoperability. I know that we are talking now in, in a specific environment when it has to do with a private setting or a consortium blockchain, but for a lot of businesses, interoperability is important to be able to bridge those tokens out of that private settlement and be able to connect with the real, uh, the, the public blockchains, be able to trade those tokens or those licenses, etc. So now let's talk about uh, access control. So when we're talking about access control, we're talking about different levels, right? Like the top level or more application level access control is smart contracts. Then we have EVM access control, and finally we have the consensus level access control. So smart contract, con uh, smart contract access control, the most popular access control for smart contracts is the ownership standard, uh, EAP 173, that allows you to define like who's the owner of this smart contract and then define certain requirements like only execute this action if the sender of this transaction is the owner of the smart contract. And so you can build different modifiers to enable that. But the problem with this approach is that you want more granular access control for businesses, and that's why where Open Zeppelin created this role-based access control where you have the owner of the smart contract, but you also have an admin that can onboard into different other roles. So for example, this, is, this pattern is very popular on stable coins today. For example, um, US, uh, USDC uses role-based access control to define who's the mentor, who is the burning, who can pause a smart contract in case of, a, of a vulnerability, etc. So this, this is the standard that a lot of people use today for smart contract development role-based access control. So taking it to back to our research case, keep in mind that this, was, this did not exist when we started doing this project back in 2017. Um, so this was one of the big hurdles, but today basically how you could define role-based access control is that you have the companies or the controller account of the company that has like an admin role and then they, you can define specifically that admin uh, the price of the license uh, for this particular project or the duration of the license or specific terms for that uh, license. Um, and then the next one is EVM access control. Um, I don't know why it's a bit um, change, but anyways, um, the, what we, what we, this framework that we just developed with EVM OS allows um, businesses to define their own access control for the EVM instance. And what do I mean by access control for the EVM instance? Um, when we talk about access control for smart contracts, 
it's very granular and it assumes that every single smart contract implements this interface for ownership or role-based access control. But how do you define who can actually deploy a smart contract? Or who can call this smart contract? So this, uh, this framework that we, we developed, uh, EVMOS, allows you to be able to specify those things. So you can have a permissionless environment, a permissioned environment, or even a restricted environment. Permissionless, everyone can deploy, but a specific set of blocked addresses. A permissioned environment, no one can deploy except a specific set of allowed uh, addresses or accounts. And a restricted environment, which is very, like, might seem counterintuitive, but the reality is that you, today you can create a restricted environment where no one is able to deploy smart contracts. So you have, you preload the smart contracts um, ahead of time. So when you launch the network, you can deploy the smart contracts and then they become accessible for, um, for users and they can interact with them. So that's, those are the three levels of access control that we define. And we define this for not only deployment of smart contract, but also for calling smart contract. So this is particularly relevant of like, you don't want any uh, user or smart contract through a factory pattern to be able to deploy more smart contracts. Um, and that's a, when we have like the permissioned and the restricted access control for calling the contract when you have like, here you can see it, but it's a, from the smart, so this is smart contract, you compile it, have the bytecode, and then you deploy the smart contract instance into the, it says Ethereum network here, but in the EVMOS framework. Um, and then for we also have this access control for calling smart contract. Now, why is this particularly relevant? Because you can, uh, in the case of active security vulnerabilities, which is something that security enterprises take really seriously, uh, you can pause a smart contract. So in case of an active vulnerability, you just uh, say, these are the addresses that can post a contract. You cannot take away funds. You cannot take up like revert transactions or anything like that, but you just like halt trading altogether. Um, and so this basically allows you to have like granular control of who can call or who cannot call in case of a, of a security vulnerability. And so taking, taking this back, uh, you could say that only the centralized onboarding node is the one allowed to deploy contracts. Or only the accounts from the uh, different companies, from Qualcomm or from the other companies in this uh, consortium blockchain, can deploy the smart contracts or call them altogether. So you can have uh, a network where everyone, like, everyone can read the data, everyone can read uh, what the licenses are in this case, but no one can write to the blockchain. N like, so read only access. So the specific benefits about this is like you have granular access for who can deploy or who can call smart contracts. Enhanced security in the case of an active vulnerability. You, you also have spam prevention. So in case you have a permissionless environment, you can just restrict uh, spammers as well. You can just like stop spamming, spamming my, my network. I don't want you to keep deploying contracts if you keep increasing the storage costs and requirements. And that means also you reduce the infrastructure costs for your blockchain. So you have a lightweight, lean state where you can deploy these smart contracts. And then finally, the, the other level of access control is consensus level access control. Um, and here you have, uh, it says permissionless permission. So <laughs> permission like public, no central authority. You have hybrid here, maybe by one authority. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, private uh, networks and consortium networks, right? Like you have like different levels here that you can basically say who is validating or proposing my transactions. And for that, you have the validator nodes that are proposed by governance. This is something that you can achieve with our stack as well from a granular level of access control from the consensus level, not only from the smart contract level uh, or from the virtual machine. So taking it back, say I want company A, company B, and company C to have a validator node, and those are the ones that are ensuring that the transactions are valid and proposing or ungrouping these transactions into block and posting it 
for everyone to get the consensus. And um, we also made a big announcement last week when we introduced this framework that Ripple is going to be the, f uh, the first customer um, that they chose this framework specifically to create a proof of authority chain, so using this access control on the consensus level with a permissionless EVM. So everyone can deploy, everyone can deploy smart contracts and call smart contracts, but the, the validator nodes are proof of authority, so permission. Um, so yeah, we're onboarding Ripple to the Cosmos ecosystem and to our EVMOS ecosystem through this framework. Um, so a little bit more about our operating system EVMOS um, is that you can extend the functionality and we were talking ab previously about uh, we don't want to lose our devices and then lose our uh, tokens that are, uh, that are in them and so one particular uh, technology that is really important for authentication that is going on right now is uh, called Passkey's technology uh, that allows the secure enclave to generate a public and private key and so you generate a binding from the device with the blockchain and so you can use the technology to onboard users uh, in only two steps as opposed to multiple steps where they have to keep the list of private uh, mnemonic keys or seed phrases as well. Um, so this is a thing that you can implement uh, using, a f using this uh, technology in our stack. We also allow um, controlling, so thinking about like how the entire ecosystem is expanding, right? Like we think that there's going to be more, lay more networks in the future. And so one particular problem for users uh, specifically for onboarding is like how do you keep track of the tokens how do you keep track of the networks and so you with this framework you can have a, a main account on one blockchain that controls sub accounts on other blockchains so you don't need to connect to blockchain b or c or d you can just have like one account that controls your entire portfolio in the entire ecosystem so this extremely reduces the overhead for new users. You don't need to keep track, like the user actually doesn't know that they're using blockchain. Between this and the passkeys technology, it's like really easy for them to interact with the entire ecosystem. And also when it comes to liquidity fragmentation um, and token fragmentation is that there are different standards for token, right? And so we created the best token user experience uh, by abstracting away all the complexities from ERC-20s and making it significantly easier for infrastructure providers to keep track of those tokens uh, by using native tokens as opposed to as ERC-20s. So that means that previously all these ERC-20 token compliance uh, were different than other networks or native tokens. And so we created an abstraction, a wrapper, that allows them to be also treated as ERC-20 tokens without them really needing them to be. So this uh, allows you to keep track of all your tokens in your wallet from scratch without it, you having to do anything else. And that's it. Um, thank you so much for your time and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Frederico. Uh, so, who has a question? Uh, maybe I start. Um, why OS operating system? Yeah, it's a more more a marketing name than anything else. But uh, okay. what we want to achieve with that is um, that you are really in control of all the aspects of your network, from consensus layer you can modify the EVM and you can deploy the smart contract on the application layer. So in the same way as the EVM allows you to modify, like keep track of the kernel and the, um, and the entire stack, um, but the OS in this case uh, refers to the, the entire blockchain stack from consensus, um, networking and application as well. Okay, okay, yeah. Marketing. All right. <laughs> uh, sounds sounds very useful. Any uh, questions from the audience now? All right. Uh, well, in yes. 
Uh, thank you for interesting talk. I have a question regarding the aspects of the validator. So, for example, in, in Ripple, they will basically be using the proof authority. How yes. other customers, for example, do envision to they use the aspect of actually having the validators in the in the network? Do you also want to provide it as a service that you will have a fixed set of validators that can be used for different yeah. chains, or what is the plan on yeah, the Yeah. So th the goal is that every single network can define its own set of validators. Um, so in a per permissionless environment, anyone can send a transaction to declare their interest of writing a validator, and then they get sorted according to the amount of uh, proof-of-stake blockchains that they run. Um, in a permissioned environment, or in this case proof of authority, you need to get approved by the other members of the validator set uh, to be part of that. And so that's something that we allow through governance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so like you send a governance proposal to the network, and then the validators vote to have you join the validator set. And if I can a follow up, uh, do you also then rather focus on the nodes to have certain hardware requirements, or do they still need to have also some stake actually in order to later um, be operating the stuff? So in this in this case, like well, it really depends because uh, a lot of the foundations or the teams behind the blockchains also have like delegation programs where they stake tokens with different validators according to their contributions to the ecosystem or their contributions to the network. So um, that question really depends on which specifically, but we do, for example, in our case, we also provide delegation according to if you run infrastructure outside of the your uh, validation requirement, like val validation task, or you also provide community services or community support, mm -hmm. they also get rewarded with that. Perfect, thank you very much.